Welcome back to the channel, Chimera Crew, and welcome to the first episode of, I guess, this year's spooky season. I hope you enjoyed the new intro. I worked pretty hard on that. I'm pretty happy with it. Hope you are too. And so, yeah, you know, I'm going to basically, be, uh, you know, from now through, you know, Halloween, I'm going to be putting out some videos that have some kind of spooky undertones. I figured we'd start off slow with the spookiness, so the topic of today's video is five groups that are not cults, but they might as well be because they exhibit uh, many forms of cult-like behavior. So yeah, I've got five basically groups, organizations, uh, movements, fandoms, what have you, that are not actually, they, they can't officially be considered a cult, but the people in the groups exhibit many similar behaviors and states of mind as cult members do and um, if you're a member of one of the groups that I mention uh, no shame I just call it like I see it be sure to like comment and subscribe check the links and with all that being said let's get started also just a bit of an opener the you know the concept of something being cult like often involves a few common traits associated with actual cults such as intense loyalty and us versus them mentality groupthink or idolization of a leader or idea so these groups while not actual cults can exhibit behaviors or structures that resemble cult dynamics uh, so yeah with that being said let's get going all right starting off at number one we have the people of north korea now in many ways the people of north korea are victims of a cult of personality held by their leaders the kim family one of the big things that uh you know i feel is very cult-like about the people of north korea is like many people who are in a cult you unfortunately are born into it basically anyone living in north korea from 1945 until present day has been more or less forced to uh, be part of this cult that deifies uh, their originally their supreme leader Kim Il Sung and afterwards his descendants. But yes, the current leadership Kim Jong Un and his pre his predecessors fought, they have a foster an extreme form of idealization idolization and loyalty from their citizens. State propaganda portrays the leader as nearly divine, with widespread reverence taught from a young age. This environment mirrors cult-like structures uh, in the following ways. Most uh, prominent, the deification of the leaders. The Kim Dynasty is treated almost like gods, with mythology built around their existence, and a lot of this is untrue, much like the mythology surrounding those who go on to form cults and say things like, I'm the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, or I'm I've, you know, that's no different than uh, Kim Il-sung writing like, what is something like 40 operas or something like that. Another big part about cults is isolation, and citizens of North Korea are isolated from the outside world, with a limited to narrow worldview dictated by the regime. And, you know, just this is very cult-like in that cults will try to, uh, you know, keep their members isolated so that they can't form their own opinions by seeing that, hey, the rest of the world isn't as evil as you say it is. I mean, apparently, the people of North Korea are told that they win, like, more Olympic medals than any other country and have won the World Cup every year for the past forever. And, of course, none of this is true, but because they have no way to confirm that, I mean, yes, some of them probably realize it's all bullshit, but, you know, you're definitely not going to say that because, you know, you're, you're being... Uh, watched at all times. And this is, of course, the groupthink dynamic, that any dissent is not only di discouraged, but heavily punished, leading to conformity out of both fear and indoctrination. So, you know, you're not encouraged to think for yourself any more than you would be in a cult. But while ultimately exhibiting cult-like behavior, North Korea is a totalitarian state, not a small group with a charismatic leader using manipulation tactics for personal control, which defines most traditional cults, though in many ways I do view that North Korea as a whole is just a cult on a much grander scale but 
why I don't think it officially is considered one. At number two, we have MAGA. Of course, MAGA standing for Make America Great Again is a right-wing political movement that is has become heavily associated with Donald Trump, and they often demonstrate devotion to Trump as an infallible figure, which is a very cult-like aspect. Many cults have a charismatic leader, and Trump is viewed by many to be such a figure. While, you know, certain things you might not think he's done so well in certain recent debates, he is a very charismatic individual, and many people in MAGA view him as a savior-esque figure, immune to criticism or failure in the eyes of his core followers. I mean, a, a huge, uh, I, I would say the majority of America was not impressed by his uh, performance in the recent debates, but any member of MAGA was basically saying the next day while everyone else was mocking him, was saying about how great he did and how well he spoke, which, uh, you know, was, they were, you know, honestly jumping through some mental hoops, but that's because of their devotion to their charismatic leader. Another cult aspect, much like the people of North Korea I mentioned earlier, group think that dissent, you know, dissent within this group is heavily discouraged, with those questioning Trump all often labeled as traitors or rhinos, which stands for Republican in name only. Basically, if you want to make America great again, you have to love Donald Trump. A big aspect of cults is apocalyptic thinking. There's a good versus evil narrative, you know, our way or the world's going to end. And there's definitely this good versus evil narrative where Trump's defeat is seen as the downfall of America. But again, it's not actually a cult. Despite the intense loyalty and group cohesion, MAGA is a political movement, not an insular group where followers are completely isolated or manipulated in the way cults traditionally operate. These people have been allowed to make their own choices, come to their own decisions, their own ideologies, and they have decided this is the way for them. They are free to leave at any time. They simply choose not to. But I'll say this simply when it comes to American politics, there are no easy answers and there is no one person who is going to save us from the destruction of this country. It, this country will only get better through cooperation, compromise, and, you know, learning to actually address the causes of problems rather than placing the blame on people who believe differently than you. Keeping with the idea of eccentric billionaires, at three we have Elon Musk fanboys. You know, what are these people's, uh, you know, cult-like aspects. What what makes the people who love Elon Musk, the owner of X, aka Twitter, and Tesla and all that, what, what make them cult-like? Well, fans of Elon Musk, especially online, exhibit extreme reverence for Musk to the point of treating his every tweet or statement as gospel, and they also exhibit these tendencies. Again, we have the idolization. They view Musk as a genius visionary, and they'll defend him from any criticism, even when his behavior, statements, or actions uh, are controversial. Uh, cyber trucks, anybody? This often leads to the aspect of blind loyalty. Failures or setbacks in Musk's ventures are often dismissed, with fans insisting he can do no wrong. You know, the absolute shit show that was him buying and then trying to back out of buying and eventually still having to buy Twitter, renaming it X. It's it's such a weird shift, but you know, this fanboy is like, ah, oh, it was all in his plan. And you know, that's that's kind of a cult-like aspect where it's like, no matter what your leader does, it was meant to happen. They planned it that way. They are infallible. And again, we have the groupthink and echo chambers. Musk fans tend to congregate online in spaces where dissent is minimized, creating a self-reinforcing bubble of admiration. But again, ultimately not a cult. Uh, while fervent, Musk's fan base is largely decentralized and operates more as a fandom than as a cohesive group with a manipulative control structure. If you want my personal opinion, it is Elon Musk's fans that are the reason Elon went from being a guy with some pretty good ideas to kind of a neckbeard who started to believe his own hype. Because when you tell somebody that they're the Messiah enough times, eventually they're going to believe it, no matter how smart or rich they are. 
At number four, we have Taylor Swift fans. That's right, the Swifties. Please don't come at me. Swift's fan base, known as Swifties, exhibit levels of loyalty that can sometimes border on extreme, and the traits they uh, exhibit are, again, idolization of a celebrity. Swift is often viewed as beyond criticism, and fans can be fiercely protective of her, launching online campaigns against perceived enemies or detractors. There's a collective defense. There's a strong sense of group identity where fans rally to defend Swift against any criticism or attack. Again, we have the groupthink and we have internal hierarchy. There's a sense of belonging and some fans go to great lengths to prove their loyalty, even policing other fans' behavior. There's also like a mythology that's been built up around her with fans looking at everything she does as like a secret message specifically for them. And while in some cases this is very true and she will drop hints and leave cryptic messages about releases or tours or whatever. Sometimes they are reading something into nothing, but, uh, you know, if it makes them happy, who cares? Because ultimately, they're not a cult. Swifties are a fandom, not a cult. While there is a devotion to Swift, it lacks the manipulative or isolating tactics typical of cults. If anything, while some people look at Swifties and go, wow, you're just obsessed, it's not healthy, I, I don't really know of anybody who has ruined their lives being loyal to Taylor Swift. While I am not personally a fan, I see no harm in Swifties just being Swifties. All right, guys, we're going to get to that fifth final piece here in just a second. But please, while I have your attention, we are still trying to get to a thousand subscribers. And if you could do me the honor of clicking the like button, hitting subscribe, and maybe even leaving a comment, maybe leave. Let's see, what comment should it be? Tell me about a group that you think uh, is cult like uh, that, you know, but but isn't. It's just a normal group. But, you know, they have some concerning behaviors. Leave your example in uh in the comments and if i get enough of them we'll make a part two maybe even a part three uh, so like comment subscribe and with that being said let's get to the final piece of today's groups that aren't a cult but might as well be all right chimera crew our final fifth group today are k-pop fans yes k-pop fans as a whole a fans of korean pop music what are their cult-like aspects? Well, K-pop fandoms, uh, like those around groups such as BTS or Blackpink, are known for their intense loyalty to the point where fans will engage in coordinated campaigns to promote or defend their idols. And other such aspects include devotion to idols. K-pop idols are often treated with an almost reverential respect, and fans can be fiercely protective of them. Also, there's even like a hierarchy within. You have your wrecker, you have your bias. I don't fully understand what those mean, but I hear about it from my wife all the time as she is a K-pop fan. This loyalty is organized. They, uh, K-pop fandoms often coordinate online efforts, whether it's promoting their idols, combating criticism, or just creating a sense of collective identity, which again, very cult-like. There is an exclusivity to this group identity. Being part of a K-pop fandom can create an us versus them mentality where fans feel bonded over their shared admiration and can clash with other fandoms. Now, one of the things unique on this list to K-pop fandoms that uh, is a very cult-like aspect that the previous ones have not displayed is the idea that what ultimately Cults are founded so that an individual can obtain either money or power, and oftentimes both. The idea of a cult is they will use all the trappings of that cult to separate you from your money willingly. And K-pop does this in a way that the others do not. North Korea, that's a government. Those people, the government's totalitarian. They can take all the money no matter what. They don't have to manipulate people. MAGA, yeah, they're going to get you to give co campaign contributions, maybe buy a t-shirt or a hat, but ultimately that's, you know, that's all going to the cause. It's not about making anyone specifically rich. Elon Musk, well, he has a business. He's going to make products. You can buy them. That's all there really is to it. Taylor Swift, she wants you to buy her album, she wants you to go to her concerts, but ultimately that's normal. She's a musician. So what is it you might ask that K-pop does 
that, uh, you know, I believe is cult-like and manipulative beyond, you know, trying to sell albums and tickets and, you know, merchandise. Well, it's, it, it is that, but it's how they do it. This is the part of K-pop that amazes me, and I, my wife has tried to explain the appeal of it to me. I still don't get it. But when an album comes out of one of uh, her, you know, fandoms, one of the bands that she is a stan for, one of the groups, uh, there it won't just be one album. There will be the, the, the same album will come out in several different formats, different album covers, all that, and they all have uh, little photo cards and other various things in them, little goodies, so to speak, of within the album, and you don't know what you're going to get. So, despite the fact that this album can be perfectly easily bought uh, on, you know, iTunes or Amazon or wherever you have it, they have convinced their fans to spend good money. The average K-pop album is like 40 bucks, to, and they're going to buy multiple copies of the same album, one, so they can get all the different covers, which is a tactic or I, I always attribute to, like, when Marvel made, like, the four different covers of X-Men number one. Huge cash grab. And so they can get all the different little photo cards. So you are using people's, like, fandom, their, their loyalty to the figures in order to get them to purchase multiple copies of outdated technology so that they can get tiny little picture cards that they're basically paying $40 for about five, uh, you know, maybe 50 cents of, of cardboard. I personally find this to be a very manipulative way to do business, but you know, if it brings people happiness, who am I to question them? Because again, ultimately, not a cult. You know, while their fans are dedicated uh, and the business practices of the companies that come out with these groups, uh, that manufacture these groups can be a little bit manipulative and shady, uh, they're just uh, a part of a larger entertainment ecosystem lacking the isolated controlling leadership that defines cults. Nobody is making these people spend their money. Nobody is forcing them to enjoy this music. It's just something that they found that they like and they're willing to spend their hard-earned money on it and, you know, more power to them, but it can get a little ridiculous at times. I say this as I stare at my massive collection of painted miniatures that I've probably spent way more on over the years than my wife has ever spent on K-pop albums. So yeah, that's the video, guys. You know, we're going to talk. They are going to get spookier. This one was kind of dipping my toes into something that's kind of creepy, kind of weird behavior that certain organizations uh, employ that has a very cult-like aspect to it. But ultimately, they are, for the most part, harmless. You know, some of the entities on this list, I'm not going to say which ones. That's potentially up for debate. Also, I think it's funny how we started in North Korea and ended in South Korea. I did not mean to do that when I was making the list and only after compiling it did I kind of realize what I did. But hey, that's really all there is to it, guys. I'm Mr. Sean. This is Chimera Miniatures. I really and truly hope that you alpha great day and an even beta tomorrow. And again, if you are a member of one of these groups, no shame, live your life. It's just how I see it. And that's my opinion. And I'm sticking to it. Bye bye. Now the show has reached its end, but fear it doesn't fade. Mr. Sean will haunt your dreams. In the shadows where we've played, we've brought you chills, we've shared the frights, but the nightmares won't be gone. Chimera miniatures whisper still until the break of dawn. So don't forget, we'll meet again.